Well, welcome, James and Roger Deakins. Wow, this is so great. I'm sorry we can't see you. It's too bright. <laughs> well, that's one view. Good thing. All right. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for being so generous with your time. And we had the workshop yesterday, which I want to talk about. And we're going to have this talk today, and then tomorrow is another event, and then Sunday is even another event. And that's mm -hmm. just been amazing. And everybody's so thrilled to have you here, so thank you. I also want to big, give a big shout out to uh, Wendy Roderweiss and her amazing crew for putting all this together. So let's give them a huge round of applause. I'm just going to introduce myself to people who don't know me. My name's Dana Cupper. Uh, I teach full-time here at DePaul University. I teach cinematography and documentary cinematography, and I'm a documentary cinematographer. So that's, you know, been my lifelong passion has been cinematography, so this is a dream come true. <laughs> okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about Team Deacons and how, that, how it started, how it evolved, how you guys work together, What's that all about? Well, we, um, when we met, I was a script supervisor and Roger was shooting. And so when we got married, we sometimes worked together, sometimes we didn't. And we realized we kind of wanted to be together. So I stopped scripting, but I just can't not do something. So I have a lab background. So I would be behind the scenes working on, um, you know, the dailies and making sure that we were able to screen them correctly and all of making that. Making sure the equipment was there on the day we needed it yeah, and all sorts right. of things. And then as digital came in, it does sort of complicate things and you really need more. So yeah. I ended up... You wouldn't think that, would you? Digital, you think it'd make it easier, but it's made it much more and more, more complicated. I mean, any transition is difficult, right? I mean, the, the industry had to transition and the labs and the editors and the communication there. And I mean, it's even still evolving. But it's also, you know, the formats and what... Are you going open gate? Are you, um, you know... What are you protecting for? And because you can also, sometimes we get stuck with them. Um, on the IMAX. workflow. IMAX, yeah. <laughs> the, on the workflow, the it workflow, used to be, that's true. Oh, a camera negative, Different. and you printed it. Oh, yeah, send simple. it to the lab. <laughs> but we have to figure out debaring and, and all of the steps along the way. So it, it was natural that I came in as the workflow person. But also, we work. Um, we work together, so we read the script together, we talk about whether we want to do it, we meet the director together, we go in to prep together, and I know what he's trying to achieve, and we do the meetings, and then if he needs to be in one meeting... <laughs> no, don't say that. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it means that I can be in one meeting, he can be in another, and I oftentimes um, liaise with the visual effects. Because now movies have so many visual effects, and oftentimes the visual effects people want to shoot it a certain way, and Roger doesn't want to shoot it that way, but there's always a compromise. And I sit down and I ask them what they're trying to achieve and how we could maybe shoot it a different way. So, and then when we're actually get into shooting, um, I'm checking all the equipment and making sure that, because schedule changes and then everybody knows, okay, that crane's now that day and that day. But also when we're on set and Roger's focused on shooting, production will come on set and want to know something about the next week and they do not want to ask Roger because he is so focused. But they oh, can I ask, me. To ask me. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, in fact, I oper operate the camera. I'm kind of like completely on the set about the scene. And so, you know, James is basically covering yeah. all that. Yeah, so I'll yeah. talk to them, you know, and uh, they're not afraid to ask me questions. <laughs> you know, I got to say, I think, Raj, you got a pretty good deal there. I got a good deal, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it looks like you do all the worrying <laughs> and all the details, and then that leaves you free to create, which yeah. is amazing. And obsess over the, uh, the image, yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, speaking of post and all that, if you guys want to listen to something amazing and we're going to talk about your podcast but the podcast where you, you interviewed the post-production supervisor on 1917 if you haven't listened to that i mean i just I, uh, unbelievable description of what that took to post 
to post that. It's amazing. Oh, the the DI producer. Okay, not yeah. the post super, but oh, the, DI. the DI producer. Yeah, right, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I don't know all the titles. No. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> no, I was wondering, did we do that? And I just fell asleep. No, <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's just me. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, that was so interesting because we were using a prototype of a camera that had never gone through the system before and it never occurred to me and I had realized that the software couldn't recognize it because what was this camera? Because there is an identification in every camera. Oh, so we no. had to figure that out and, and get them all to upgrade their software to recognize this camera. And then also we were working without cuts and usually when you're in a DI, you you can be working on real one and when those visual effects come in that are always at the last minute they could put it in real five while you're working on real one but it was just all one except for the fact when he falls down the stairs there's a cut there yeah so we had a big real one and a little real two wow <laughs> so at least we could be working on one and the other one could be um being uh, updated okay <laughs> and so let's talk about the podcast. So I, I was boring enough on that one. But I'm pretty boring on post. You lost sorry. me. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll shut up. <laughs> Not to me. I think it's interesting. No, but the podcast itself. I was looking, and um, it just can't be right. 230 episodes. Is that right? Mm, yeah, a little more than that. that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, That's we a lot. Yeah, it is week. a yeah. lot. Yeah. And so, how did it all start? And why, you know, 230, you guys seem to be like, this is great for us, and talk, talk yeah. about that. Well, it started, we were doing um, publicity for 1917, and we did a lot of Q&As, and we, then afterwards, we were always asked the same questions. So I said to Roger, well, maybe we should do a podcast. And Roger said, uh, what's a podcast? You always made that joke, I'm but sorry. I actually <laughs> did know no. You know you <laughs> I'm sorry. Roger. I have listened to them, but I know what they are. <laughs> and it just kind of evolved over time into what it is now, which is basically a conversation. Yeah, it started off, we were just going to talk our immediate crew and friends and people we've worked with, you know, on, on certain films so we could talk about things we were familiar with, much like an extension of the website we've had where we're asking, mm. asking people's questions, uh, answering people's questions. And, and then it just expanded, and now everybody comes up when we like them. They say, "Oh, we love your podcast," you know. And so I'd, I'd be running, stop. I'd be running <laughs> on a beach in Santa Monica, and people say, "We," because we stopped for a little while. And they said, "When do you start up again? When do you start?" And they stopped me in the middle of a run, you know. I go, "Oh God!" And now we can't get out of it. Yeah. But it's kind of, it is kind of fun because we talk to people we've never it's met great. before. It's and, great. It's yeah. great. I mean, I said last week we talked to Wim Wenders, who's always been like a hero. I've never met him, never talked to him before, but we sat down and talked yeah. for two hours about <laughs> the goalkeeper's fear of the penalty kick and, and, you know, all these wonderful movies he did all through his career and the last movie he did, which is Perfect Days, which is you know, a wonderful yeah. little film, you know, and it's just a joy to talk to somebody yeah. that has so much passion and kind of embodies kind of the history of movies for the last 50 years. <laughs> what do you hope people get out of the podcast? Well, you know, every episode's different because sometimes it's very technical and so that works for some people that want to know technical. Other times we spoke to a director recently and it was more his uh, instinctual way of directing, so that was more theoretical. Um, so we well, never know what it's going to be. I, I hope people get out of it what I wish I'd had when I was a kid some kind of connection to a business that didn't wasn't like that's something other people do it wasn't kind of this mystery mm. and i think the whole thing and you know you're talking to whim the other day you know it's like you're just talking to somebody who loves what they do and and how people got there you know the the, the ways people james always asks the first question is how to get where you are and just the ways people started out and found their route into film. I just find it fascinating. And I, I just say, I remember when I was a kid not knowing what to do, but loving movies, I didn't, didn't consider it as a possibility of something I could do, you know? So I think that is a lot of the motivation for us doing it. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's also interesting how 
there are so many different ways to do things. So one yeah. production designer approaches it one way, another one approaches it a different way, but with the same end, which is to put it on screen. So I, I find it interesting that it is a thing that you can make your own. You can approach mm. it the way that works for you, because what works for me might not work for you. Mm. Yeah, and there's something on the set, too, where everybody's just doing their job and we're under such a time pressure we don't always get to know, know why people are doing stuff or how they're doing it they mm -hmm. just do it really well and it must be great to hear like well i did this because i learned on that that this is and you're like wow really yeah or sometimes you don't even realize that they actually took care of that part right. of it but uh, so it's great and and then we we talked one time to a camera uh trainee and we because we are trying to cover everything and um i thought well what are we going to talk with her about but it was great it was really interesting yeah 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 starting out but starting out how you and make friends and gradually find your way, you know, I think it's really interesting. And we never know what it's going to be like. We talked to um, someone that we know and we quite like, Anthony Dodd Mantle, and he's such a lovely guy, but he's a talker. And so well, we you asked should him. ask him here, it's great, because you could say, well, how did you start to, how did you begin cinematography? <laughs> and that's all you need for an hour and a half. Hour and a half later, <laughs> and it will be magic, so yeah. it's quite, it's, you know, it's, no, a, it's a nice gig a if you can get it. You know? Yeah, it's great, but then somebody afterwards said, my God, you really got him on tape well, we there. Got him. We, yeah, we didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Anthony, I mean, we can tease about it yeah. because he's a good friend. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I want to talk about the workshop yesterday because um, mm. after you guys, you guys would come in and then work with the students and then go off to the other sets and then I would run in and <laughs> grab the students and I'd say, how the hell was it? How was it? And a lot of them were really like shell-shocked. It was really funny. They were just like, oh, they're just real people. They're real people. <laughs> and one student, and I wrote it down because I thought you'd enjoy what they said. They said... <laughs> He just got lost in the shot. You can tell he really loves this. <laughs> and I thought, what a great example to our students that, you know, that not only it's just it's just you and the mom, you know, the picture and you're messing with the lights and you're just it was it was such a great example of your of the passion. Yeah, what can I say? I do love it, yeah. <laughs> and I, was, I, I went for a walk this morning in the park and down by the lake. I was thinking, I, there was a guy that was doing, a, I don't know if he's here, they were doing the shot of the interviewee standing, sitting behind the desk and in a green room and the camera was Yesterday. pushing in. Yes. And I'm walking down there, damn, I should have said, why is she sitting on that side? Why aren't we on her back <laughs> and she's sitting this side? And you're pushing into the back of her head. So he was still thinking Which about is what, it. Which yeah. is what, what Denny would probably, Villeneuve would have probably done, you know. <laughs> I, I, just because there's so many, there's a million ways to do it and they're mm -hmm. probably all wrong and they're all right, who knows. <laughs> but it's it just to throw different ideas out there and just, the idea that if there's not one way that you can think about it and turn it around and look at it in different places. So, yeah, I was walking along the lake shore there thinking, well, that could have been like that. It was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I am passionate about it. Because, <laughs> as I say, it's an exploration. Nothing is absolutely right. You know, and just sometimes when you feel, when it makes you feel something, then it maybe it is right. But you can't really say why. I could never express in words why I think some shots I've done over my life have really affected me. You know, that's when I think, that's when I get a real kick out of it. I kind of like, I watch that shot and Sid and Nancy walking back up that thing. It might seem like totally inconsequential, but I think it says so much about those two characters at that moment there. You know, those cops and all that nonsense and all that handout shit. But they're kind of walking back and it's like, that's all doesn't exist anymore. It's just the two people walking up under these harsh little fluorescents. I really always thought that was a really cool shot. And how did it come about, that shot? How did, did you think well, of just it? Alex you... were just, um, we, were, we were scouting a location. We knew we could be shooting out on the Thames and um, I think we just we just talked about doing that shot, you know, just to end, just to walk away from the chaos. You know, how do you isolate 
the, t the two the two characters in a sort of it's slightly yeah in a slightly sort of romantic way you know and um, at the time a lot of the a couple of the police boats were actually the real police we we yeah you know, some had agreed to be in the shop but uh, they were kind of closing us down because it was a bit chaotic so <laughs> really? yeah 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 no i feel i like don't know why i just love that shot it's very silly little shot but i love it <laughs> and then it ends you pan over yes to the old uh, london uh, <laughs> town hall thing you know yeah <laughs> now but they're so great. I mean, we only did a couple of takes. I mean, Gary and Chloe were so great. That how was much, brilliant, yeah. How much lighting? Well, we put those fluorescents up. I mean, we swapped them out and put in some green tubes, slightly green tubes. You know, yeah. there wasn't much there when, when we were scouting. Um, okay, I also wanted to say, too, that in terms of passion and a great example, is this example that you guys are showing about sharing knowledge and you're doing it with the podcast and you're doing it with the workshop yesterday. And I think that in terms of showing our students that, you know, it's not just enough to know it, but to pay that back. And I'm just wondering where that came from and how that feels to you guys and why you feel so strongly about paying back. It's the same thing, you know, like starting out, I didn't have that opportunity. So yeah. I think, you know, it's kind of nice to, you know, if people want to listen to us wrap it on, then it's kind of fine with us. I think yeah. also I started out as a script supervisor and no one, and, and you're a department of one, and no one would help me, and I swore that I would help other people because having had that experience of um, no one, you know, being willing to share. Yeah, we've been really lucky. I mean, you know, I look back, I mean, I've been so lucky. Jesus. But it's also, we get something out of it, too, because we, we get the passion, you know, we're able to talk to people, the students that are very passionate about it, and um, sometimes you don't always find that in the people that are actually doing it out there. Yeah. So it's good. That's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. it it's feeds our passion, so. Right, right. Um, Let's talk. I'm just so glad you got to meet our students and that they got to meet you because I just love our students so much. I think they're just amazing. And I always think of us as the film school people because some film schools are very elitist or to me. They pick their students, they hand pick them. We don't do that. So everybody's allowed and I just love that. Um, let's talk about yesterday and what your experience was with the workshops, with the setups and the advice that you gave and uh, how you felt that the students were able? Did they hear you? Did you? Did you? Well, I don't. I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't like walking in and saying this is what I would do. That's a problem. It's a really hard thing because I mean, I, I I did the same thing at the National Film School in England one time, and uh, a student had lit this sort of loft apartment set for moonlight. And I went and looked at. It, I said, well, it's kind of interesting, but the moon. There's only one moon and you've got like seven shadows on this wall. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but I like it. I said, well, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you know, everybody's got a different view of reality. That was certainly a strange I mean, view of reality the same, in my mind. But, you know, yeah. but, I mean, but it's fine if he liked it that way. There was something about it. I mean, you know, he didn't sort of say, well, I wanted to create this kind of fractured world, you know, which would have made sense to me because that's what it looked like. But, um, you know, so I find it hard to sort of say, you know, it would be better this way because it, it wouldn't necessarily be better any other way, you know. But it's good to show, but you could, an alternative, you could do that's it this way yeah. and then well, you can choose the way that you like better. Well, yeah, and like I said to you earlier, it's about think of about it another way. Uh, I, I, one thing that struck me most actually yesterday was it reminded me of myself because I thought everything was overlit and I used to overlight like crazy. Especially when I got nervous, I'd put another light on. <laughs> I was really aware of it. I couldn't stop myself. I'd be like, you know, like Dr. Strange love, you know, trying to stop myself doing it. But, yeah. Where does it come from, this overlighting? Just completely kind of stress. 
nervous, yeah. you know, the more nervous they get, the more lights I put on. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's like you're staring at this image and you just want to make it the best you can, and you think, if I just add more lights, it'll be better somehow? No, but I, no, I mean, I'm exaggerating it, but you, you, do, you do tend to sort of play safe, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You do that yeah. when you're tired too. When at I'm the tired, end of night definitely, shoots, definitely. Yeah. When I'm tired, I, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, you know, because I don't tend to. I've got a light meter. I use a light meter all the time, but I tend to. I tend to light by eye and judge exposure by eye. So at the end of the day, when I get tired, I would just always open up a little bit more <laughs> just to make sure. <laughs> it's and it's usually my job to go. You know, you're tired. Yeah, that's right. Maybe you take tired. the light off. Are you sure it's? <laughs> Are you sure it's 2-2 two, two or yeah. 4? <laughs> I have noticed that with camera people who have been doing it a long time, it's they're able to light by eye. And, uh, yeah, you don't start there, though. You know, you no, have to really... It was, it was always funny. I kind of Dougie Slocum, right, who I went on, I was on one of the sets he was lighting. And he would always... He, would not, he was famous for not using a light meter. And he would put his hand <laughs> up and say, oh, yes. it's Four, five, five, six. <laughs> and yeah, but there was a brute art right there, and he knew it was like 25 feet away from his hand, so he knew a brute art would give him five, six, 25 feet, or whatever it was, at half flat. So, I mean, he didn't need a meter, he had a meter, it was a brute art. <laughs> if you know what a brute art, a carbon art, you know, very old fashioned light, but wonderful <laughs> art. Light. Beautiful light, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing you had commented on, which I thought was super interesting, was that. A lot of the students were using the wrong lights for certain effects. Well, and again, I wouldn't say it's the wrong light, yeah. but I would have... Put words in his mouth. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I might have chosen a different unit to try and do the effect I thought they were trying to do. But I thought, okay. one, of the, I thought one of the interesting things yesterday was like, what's really important now, and I think it's become more and more important to me, but I think to most cinematographers, is the choice of the light. And it's not only the choice of the light, whether it's whatever this Gemini or what they are, it's whether which, which practical you're going to use, mm. what the set dress is going to bring you, you know? Okay. Is the light, is it a soft thing with just shade? We were doing one there yesterday and there was a nice little light with a soft shade. And I said, well, it was the thing we did in No Country for Old Men. Well, what if we put on the floor? So the, it's not the the light from the shade that's light, and it's coming, it's a harsh and more directional light coming out from the bottom. You know, it's things like that. It's choosing the source to create a kind of mood in the shot. And that's not something you just do by bringing in kind of lights and artificially creating that look, you know? And you had talked also about building a world. And I guess I always thought of your work, yes, you build a world in the screen, and I guess I thought of it that way, but you yesterday were talking about you were building a world on the set and that it was important to you that the actors felt that there was some, that they were able to get into their character because of the atmosphere on the set yeah. and the way it was lit and just that whole, and I just thought, wow, that's such an interesting idea because I think we think of cinematography as what lives in the little box of the, the frame, but to mm -hmm. think of it in terms of building a world the environment for the actors and how that how that translates through the screen in a way that's intangible. Well, I was thinking about 1984 then. You know, there was a scene with these big telly screens and like, you know, 700 people in the crowd and, and people being hung, you know, hang, uh, seven people being executed. And it's not in this. This is this is very tight. You don't see it. This is another place. This is a clip. much smaller. <laughs> this is a much smaller location. We did something similar, but um, you know the whole question we had in pre-production about 1984 is how we were going to do the telescreens. You know the the images played back on what meant to be the telescreens. And Mike and both Mike and I wanted to do it all in camera, and it's actually everything is in camera. And say this one scene. There's two telescreens that are actually 45 feet by 70 or something, I don't know, huge telescreens. Uh -huh. And we actually projected it, a, a guy projected it with Charlie Staffel, we used carbon arcs to project the image on it. We made the playback material ourselves because it had to be what we wanted playing back and we made it to a certain density so we could get enough light out of it. And he created a screen out of a, a 3M paint that was part front projection part, normal projection, you know, cinema projection screen, like white screen. 
And so we could just get enough light level from this projection so we could do it all in camera. So a long way of saying, but doing that, you actually create an environment for the actors to act in and everybody can see these people are being hung right there. And on the screen, you see it played back because we shot it prior to the main unit. We shot the playback material and then had to match it on the day. You know, I, I just, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do. It's fun to do, but it just, you create this world. You create this world that everybody's in. It's quite, it was kind of quite horrendous because these people are being hung, you know. Well, it's it really also, felt real. it's the same as um, Blade Runner. Everybody assumes that's all visual effects, but we created the sets and the mid-ground and everything for the actors as well as us, because yeah. then they were actually there and the, they the, knew. The, yeah, the scene you showed at the Pink Joy. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, Pink Joy is not three-dimensional in, in, in the sequence. You don't play the, there's a side shot where she leans in towards mm. Uh, Ryan with yeah. a finger points at him and it's um, yeah obviously that's digitally enhanced but, but we had a big screen and we shot Pink Joy and right. played it back so I mean that that shot there is virtually you know the one yeah. where you're facing the screen is virtually in camera I mean yeah. this one is obviously manipulated because we're not shooting a side on Mm. Uh, because the screen is is uh, one dimensional, you know, two dimensional, rather, <laughs> and uh, it's it's um, it's not coming out towards Ryan. But uh, you know, uh, yeah, we insisted on a huge amount of it. All the light, interactive light, is there yeah. because the screen is the right color and it's shining in the atmosphere. And so basically, that's part of that. I mean, and that with all the lettering and stuff is obviously uh, CG enhanced. But otherwise. But we started with the screen, so we You've had something to react there. to. And, so Ryan's got yeah. something to act, react to, and the lighting is all there. So the effects team that are doing it afterwards have always got that basis. They've got the set, the colors, and they've got the intensity, you know, and they can manipulate it. I mean, the person that taught me how to be in the union and work on shows and stuff. He always talked about how much we need to respect the actors and their process. And I don't know if we talk about it enough in film no, school. No, not enough. No, mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And so I think building that world and, and making that atmosphere for them has got to be. Yeah, I mean, it's also the, the thing about choosing a crew. You know, yeah. when we choose a crew, I mean, most of the people we've worked with, we've known for years and years and years. I mean, the Dolly Grip who did who was on uh, Blade Runner. I first met him on Barton Fink. I've worked with him just about every, every film but one, since, two since then. <laughs> and, um, and they're not loud. It, it's, right? Yeah, it's about, they're all about creating the atmosphere so when the actors come in, they feel comfortable, you know, and, and when, if they want to relate to people on the crew, the actors that is, then that's fine, they will, but the crew can respect an actor that doesn't want to know they even exist, which is quite a few actors. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they've got to focus If you don't have a job. performance, you don't have to film. So, I mean, I don't think a film is a lot of pretty pictures. I think that's not what it is. It's, it's basically creating characters in a world. Because you've seen a lot of, uh, you've seen films that have great performances but are terribly, terrible technically. Yeah. But I'd rather see that film than a perfectly shot, perfect visual effects with no performance in Mind it. Mind you, it'd be nice to shoot a travelogue with no actors, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. It would be faster, right? right? It'd be, well, you get traveled. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one question I'm dying to ask is, because um, I shoot documentaries, right? And I know you started in documentaries. And when I listen to your podcast, like all these big time DPs come on there and they're all like, I started in documentary. I started in documentary. And every time I'm like, yay. <laughs> and I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about how documentary shooting strengthens fiction shooting. Um, well, it, it's different. I mean, there are, you know, like Chris Menges was a, it's one of my heroes. He's really a kind of a friend, really. Um, started in documentary. He's got a certain sensibility. You can see in his work, you know, and I think maybe that's in my work as well. But then there's people that didn't. There's people like <laughs> Jack Green was a barber and then he got picked up by a friend to go on a shoot and then suddenly he finds himself a cameraman as a cameraman. So, but he was a barber in San Francisco. But I think so, when you're... I mean, 
you know. Yeah, when you're working in documentary, you kind of have to be thinking about the cut. Okay. You have to be thinking about should I take this shot or this shot because this is only going to happen once. Uh -huh. So it makes you quicker on your feet, I think, which helps on a set that can sometimes get a little crazy because you are thinking, is this shot, you know, I'm, it gives you a kind of economy. I'm going to do one yeah. shot that's going to make it work. I think there's a lot of cinematographers that haven't gone through documentaries, haven't come up through independent movies in a way that don't think about shots and the cut, mm, mm. you know. Uh, they're maybe, you know, more from the commercial world and, and then more into the lighting, you know. Um, and, and sometimes that's, well, most of the time that's fine. The director is, you know, set in the shot a lot of the time. But I think, um, I think you have a better collaboration with the director if you kind of understand breakdown of a scene in shots and why a certain shot has a certain effect, you know, and, I, and I, do, I do think that I'm partly from documentary because especially, you know, the documentaries I did were kind of more, you know, they, they were sort of like following action, you couldn't repeat it, they weren't scripted at all mm. in any way, so, you know, you, you, you had to find, you had to sense where the best place was to put yourself to cover what was happening in front of you and then to move you know, in a way that reflected what was going on in front of you, you know, in some way. Um, yeah, as James says, it makes you kind of quick on your feet. And in technical sense, it makes you understand exposure and, and stuff, backlight, front light, and how to adjust on the lens, you know, to that, you know. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and I also think it makes, well, it makes me an observer of light that's in the world that, you know, it's, it's one thing to see it like you're just walking around, you're looking at light. But the minute you put a camera up and you start shooting something and then you start seeing yeah. how that looks on yeah. camera, but you're yeah. not affecting the light at all. You're only trying to work with it yeah. and trying to make it mm. look nice yeah. or not terrible. And then yeah. I think that that helps you in the long run. But I think also, actually, I think we miss the most valuable thing, which is an experience of life. <laughs> I think we miss this too much, you know. It's not about just what the frame is or where the lens is going, it's actually experiencing life. Because if you don't have that, what you bring into what you do. Right. You're nothing right. but a, you're just by, painting by numbers or whatever, you know. Right. I mean, surely you're bringing your experience, emotional experience, connection with life to your work. Otherwise, I don't know. You're just you a doing? technician at a point. Yeah, yeah. that's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just painting by numbers. You're kind of like, oh, it's pretty. All right, here's my, this is probably my longest question, and I have to kind of set it up a little bit, but okay. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> it's, it's really got me thinking. But so I was, you know, I knew I was going to do this interview, and I was walking around, and I found an old American cinematographer magazine, right? You know, it's from 2011. And I, you, you're on the cover, and I'm like, oh, I should probably look at it. And I look, and it's uh, In Time, right? It's an article about In Time. And in there, you had said that it was the first, a feature that you shot digitally, right? And I, it just struck me, and I thought, I think that was a first-time director, a first-time director for you, right? That was the first, first time, time you guys worked together. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, yeah, and I yeah. thought, God, that's some, that's gutsy. Like to take on a whole new camera technology to leave film behind and and embrace digital. And 2011 was pretty early. And then it's got me thinking, and I was looking through everything, and and I have, I brought receipts. I have some evidence here. So uh, in 1984, uh, they want, this is what I read, that they, you originally wanted to shoot in black and white, they wouldn't let you, and then you had researched this uh, technique called bleach bypass. Mm -hmm. And your credit is the first Western cinematographer to bring mm -hmm. your credit, I don't know, on the internet. And it also says on the internet that and we know you that's set true, projectors though. on fire <laughs> when you were testing things on 1984. Well, for me, personally, but yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was like, what? Yeah. And then uh, Wally, you know, you were you took that on as a visual consultant on Wally, which mm -hmm. seems really out of your, you know, it would have been easy mm. to say no to that. And then, oh, brother, or, you know, the post look on that, I know you had spent like two months researching, going through it was, it was a technique that really hadn't been done. 
1917, obviously, was a huge challenge, this idea of one shot, and you were pushing things technically with the wireless and the camera operating, and you took on the new camera and the whole workflow. Um, and then you also took on your, you know, the Byways, your photography book, which you haven't, if you haven't seen Byways, we have a copy, it's in a space, it's amazing. And then you're doing the, po the website that you were doing and now the podcast. It just feels like you're always about what's next. And I think that what struck me is that, because I'm from Chicago, I feel like a lot of the Chicago DPs are very conservative. They don't want to be the one that finds all the problems with the camera. They, they want to stay with what they know works, right? Because that's safe. But you take a lot of risks. But that's what makes it fun. We get yeah, but it was also the, yeah, but it was also the projects just have happened to come up and, and demanded a certain approach. I mean, 1984, yeah, Mike, Mike wanted to shoot black and white and he was really pissed they wouldn't let him shoot black and white. So we said, well, what, what can we do? And we heard that Keizu Miyagawa had done this silver tint process for um, Ozu. And... Um, but nobody knew how it was done. But I mean, we, we went to our, our lab, the lab we'd used before, and talked to them. And they had heard of an Italian lab doing something, test something similar, but nobody had actually done it on a film. Uh, and, that, you know, it, it was, yeah, rumors go around and they found that, that if, you, if you took the bleach bath, bath away from the print process or one of the bleach mm. baths anyway you get this silver left in the print and then you get basically a 50 percent desaturation a 50 percent black and white mm. you know and a much stronger sharper image so yeah i think that was 1984 was the only film where it was done it was the first film that was done on a, a major film, but it was the only film where it was done on the print i don't think anybody did it on the print afterwards because yes when yeah. we test it in a few projectors, they start to burst into flames. Well, because the, sil <laughs> the silver left it's in it, would, it would get, <laughs> the gate would get so hot because it was keeping the heat in it, would just, but so, uh, yeah. The other problem with that too is because it didn't affect the negative, there's a lot of yeah, DVDs that's... out there with full color because we weren't invited in to yeah. help what? time it. We finally yeah. redid it with Criterion and yeah, the, the right Criterion. Way. Uh, Blu-ray is the only mm -hmm. one that's halfway decent. Right? Yeah. I don't know what that was because I, I quite honestly that looked like shit, but um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. But uh, yeah, the Criterion Blu-ray is pretty close to what we intended because we were never getting the chance to time it for the, the DVD release or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't contact you and Mike was really, really, really pissed at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess in this question of risk, right, and I think that um, I think about this for our students because I think the one thing that I see in my students is this idea where they want to do things correctly and right and I think it boxes them in mm. and it's fear is something to take a risk you know has fear involved and how do you not get in over your head how do you how do you handle risk how do you challenge yourself try new things and yet not I mean I, I can only imagine that in all this and everything you've done, there's been a moment where you thought, okay, that have gone too far now. There okay, many gone moments too far. like that, yeah. Oh, you're, you're, yeah, you were just like, uh, yeah. yeah. Um. When we were doing 1917 and realized, okay, now we have to figure out how to move the camera, right. we did say to each other, did we make a mistake? Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but, you know. Yeah, it was, it, yeah. yeah. It's, what are they call it, imposter syndrome? Yeah. I mean, these are uh, yeah. projects for school. You always have self-doubt, but I mean, the, but the, you've got to start with the premise. You said they always want to try and do it right in the right way or whatever. I forget mm -hmm. how you phrased it, but there is no right. That's the point. Maybe because okay. when I grew up, I was a bit of a rebel. You know, I, I, I never really wanted to agree with anybody. And, and you're still uh, a little like oh, that. I'm probably still <laughs> like that, you know. I mean, but there is no right. There's nobody could tell you you've done it the right way. You know, I mean, yeah, the only person you can try and satisfy is yourself. Otherwise, yeah, it's nice of the director likes it, but if you're not satisfied, then what does it mean? I don't know, nothing. Paycheck. 
I mean, it takes a certain amount of confidence in yourself to be able to take on new things. Well, I don't have well, confidence yeah. in myself, but that is totally wrong because I'm one of the most least confident people on the planet, I think. But, but what's the point of doing it if you don't try? And also, what's the point of repeating yourself time yeah. and time again? Because well, it's safe. No, you know, but you, know, you, you can do doing it. it. Yeah, but that's kind of boring to do the same thing over and over again. And also you're doing a different story, so doesn't mm. a different story require something different? But also you're working with wonderful people that help you. Yeah, yeah, you know? right. And that's where the, most of the joy comes in. It's, yeah. it's finding this together. thing together. Yeah, like yeah. 1917, all the <laughs> camera take. I don't care about the actual end result and whether the one shot thing, whatever anybody thinks, but the actual way we went about it with, with, mm. with our friends and people yeah. we'd known for a long time and technicians we'd met for the first time and how everybody put their best effort in to try and get that, that camera to do what we yeah. did with it. You know, I mean, I, that's just great, you know. I mean, there's a homelessness there saying, I don't know how this works. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm going to try this. Can you help me? Well, that, I, you know, you know I, frankly, I'm not sure that everybody can do. The nicest experience I've had with a director is when a director says, well, I'm not sure how to do this, mm. which was Mike Radford, who I first worked with. He would say, you know, I'm not sure, let's work this out, you know. And then he would say, let's, let's work this out, what are we mm -hmm. gonna do here, you know? I mean, there's something, um, yeah, to be admired by people saying that they don't really know, but they want to find out. They know where they want to go, but they don't know how to get there, put it that way. Yeah. I mean, sometimes people just, I don't know, I feel like the, their ego won't let them do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and it's mm -hmm. a shame. You know, they think that, they think, especially some directors, think they have to know it all because all the they're answers, the director. Yeah. But no, I mean, the, 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 the joy is a group of people working together for the same aim. Well, we haven't looked at any clips. Is there any clip in particular that you would want to talk about that you saw that we showed? No, I mean, I just, you know, uh, <laughs> not really. I mean, no, uh, no people, I'm sure people have got questions. Yeah, um, well, we're going to get to questions in a minute, I'm sure. Um, it was it, interesting. You never showed the one that everybody always shows, which says it train. train oh, show. I know, the Jesse James. Jesse well, James. Yeah. I didn't because you're going to show good, it tomorrow. Oh, very good. Yeah. You know, I figured. No, but it's, it's, it, it's interesting. You know? <laughs> Okay. Um, well, let's, can we talk about visual consulting on Rango and the animated films? And what is that like uh, to fun. do that? It's fun. It changed. I mean, you know, the first, uh, we got to work on Wally because um, Andrew Stanton wanted to, uh, Wally to feel more like a live action film. Uh huh. And uh, the first thing, we went up and did a kind of lighting sort of workshop. But, I mean, I was doing a demonstration. It was kind of funny because, anyway. <laughs> but um, from that, they enjoyed that. And um, they, they brought us in just to, um, Andrew brought us in to kind of, uh, I say, trying to add some sort of um, live action quality to, to Wally. And then Rango was like, you know, Gore approached us. I mean, Gore... Gore storyboarded all this. I mean, the shots and the framing and everything is totally Gore. I mean, he, he's amazing how he can set up shots and create depth and all the rest. But he wanted, he, again, he wanted it, this to look like some, you know, a, a more striking live action sort of lighting than there was being done in uh, animation at the time. So we would go up to ILM with um, uh, Tim, who was um, um, overseeing the ILM uh, work being done. And we started off very early days doing reference images of, you know, different situations. There'd be this sort of bright, harsh desert with a nice puffy clouds and a blue sky. That was one look. And then there was the really blown out desert when the sort of Clint Eastwood character appears in, later in the film. And, and then there was moonlight, and then there was the crossing the freeway, and mm. you know. So we did number of references, and then all the while we were off actually working on True Grit, True Grit when a lot of it was being done, and we had a dedicated 
yeah. internet connection and we would go back and forth between images and I would write notes or Photoshop a little kind of thing in there, change the contrast or whatever and um, we worked like that and we did a lot of tests actually with all the characters because you know in animation the actual rendering of a character changes very dramatically depending on the light on them so we did a, a huge number of references with Rango, with the character of the, the gecko, because of the scales. And then uh, with uh, the mouse and different characters, the skin and the, uh, the fur would act differently. So, you know, we, we did a, a lot of references and that's, that's how that worked, really. But we were in contact with it all the way through as, um, as they were doing different scenes, you know, they wanted uh, our feedback on it. And it, it's interesting because it's a very different world and they have a layout department and a lighting department. So layout is camera and lighting is lighting. So it's very bizarre because they're not. And, and so we were always urging them to get a little closer together because to us, one relies on the other. But also, if you wanted to do something dark and put this side in the, on in darkness and they'd already started animating, the animators got mad because they couldn't see all those expressions that they had so painstakingly made. Forget that it looked good, you know, that we want to see that character. And so it was, and it takes forever to do an animated film. So that was really different too. What do you mean this scene's going to be, you know, four months but, down the road? I've got to say with ILM and Tim Alexander who was okay. that did it, it was, it was different because yeah. even this frame that's there now, the way Rango's lit with that sort of skidding kind of three quarter backlight and he's in shade and the light's bouncing up off the desert. I mean, that was kind of unusual for what people were doing in animation at the time. Yeah, the they were doing day. something really different. I mean, the light in this, yeah. in a way, what Tim and everybody did was, was kind of radical. Yeah. in that it was, was really taking, you know, a naturalistic look, you know? Yeah. I mean, how do you verbalize that to, uh, you know, in your notes? Like, what are you saying? Does that make sense? Well, you're usually yeah. talking to people who think in terms of light, yeah. too, so it's yeah, kind say, of easy. You'd say, you'd say, why is that, why is, why is your, your hot light, why is the sun so far around? Why don't we take it around to three quarters? And then you look at the reverse shot and say, well, if it's over there, then... This, this character might be front lit, which is more interesting for the shot and the moment in the mm. scene. You know, it's all that sort of thing. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, I mean, Rango's very different than, let's say, the DreamWorks things that we did for How to Train Your Dragon, because so, that's, he was really trying to do something very yeah. different on that. But that's interesting, just showing those two shots that went up, you know, the matching singles, because yeah. the lighting, if you look at it, doesn't match. But, and that was other thing with a lot of animators, because they were thinking, well, we put the sun up here, we can hold it in the sky. Unlike live action, <laughs> where you have to shoot around the days when the, scene, the sun's changing and it goes across the sky. But no, animators would say, well, we'll leave it up there so everything's going to look absolutely right. But it might look right, but it doesn't look right. <laughs> because if you had done that on that, this, this character would be too front lit. So actually, you know, one character shot um. two hours before the other character. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we had with animation more lately was the last How to Train Your Dragon. Yeah. It was interesting that they, they, the lighters went out into a forest and took a 3D capture of the light in a forest and put, the, put it on a scene that took place in a forest. And they said, well, they were so chuffed. They don't oh, look at this, look at this, this is real light. I said, yeah, doesn't it look awful? <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. You know, because it was just, it didn't make sense for the scene either, you know. Just because you can capture something that's totally real doesn't mean it's the you right should. thing for the scene, you know. So I worry about, I'm rambling on now, but I worry about now, you know, fast digital cameras and people just go on to a, like, in a location and there's a few lights there and a bit of light coming through the window, we'll just shoot. Mm -hmm. We'll rate it at 16,000 or something. And, and shoot. figure it out and later, it will, yeah. yeah. it can be great. I'm not saying that's not a great tool, 
But is it right for the scene you're doing or, or the kind of film you're making or the style of the film you're trying to, you know, I think, I think there's a danger we lose. We look at, we look at cinematographers like Jack Cardiff or, or that and they're kind of, uh, 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 you know, Dougie Slocum and uh, Ozzy Morris and that. And is that old hat because they had to light with brew arcs and all that shit. But they were doing something. They were doing it to create a mood and an atmosphere and a, a look of the film that was more than naturalism. They were trying to create naturalism, but they weren't slavish to what reality looks like. And I think that's really important. I, I worry that we're missing that with, I say, fast digital cameras and the ability to shoot anything that you can see with your eye. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, I think that goes back to the idea of building a world. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you know that it's it's not real, right. ultimately. So right. how do you? Yeah, yeah, everything's a, a fiction, really. Yeah. Well, it's like White Fred Wiseman said. You know, he shoots documentaries, and he can be more of a variety documentary filmmaker in the world. But he says, I'm shooting fiction, because as soon as I pick up a camera, I'm making a choice. Right. What I'm looking at, and then when I go in the cutting room, I make a choice of what goes together with. The other one thing that goes together with the other. So everything he says I'm doing is totally subjective. It is. But hopefully at the end, I'm being truthful to what I experienced, which I think is very interesting. And I should really apply to all filmmaking. This, now I can bring out my favorite quote, which is Picasso. He says, art is a lie that tells the truth. Well, yeah, that's basically what Wiseman would say. I wonder who said it first. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So I had, was lucky enough, New York Times did like a behind the scenes with the director, and he talked through this scene, and so now I know a little bit about it. And he said that in your pre-production, when you had talked about the coverage of this, that you were originally going to be point of view wise in the car and then in the liquor store. You were going to follow both characters and then that changed. And can you talk about your relationship in terms of pre-production, talking with a director, working through a scene, how that all? Well, it depends on the director. I mean, I, this is the first time I worked with Danny, but some, you know, some people you just click with, you know? Mm. And I, 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 I didn't remember that, but you say that, that's true. It was in the yeah. script that you, you were going with um, Hugh Jackman's yeah. character into the liquor store. And, but, we, but, you know, we had a general conversation about this script. And, I, you know, who knows who said it, but why do we go in the liquor store with Hugh Jackman? Because the film's really, at that point, it's about Jake. Uh, you know, and it's an interesting film because it does change the point of view from one character to another. But at this, we felt, yeah, we'll stay with Jake and let Hugh come to Jake. But we, we did that, we had that sort of conversation. It was nice. We had it on Prisoners a bit and we didn't really know each other that well. Mm -hmm. And then at Sicario, we had a lot more time going through the shots and how we would approach that. And that did lead to sort of visual changes in the script for sure. And then on Blade Runner, we had months. We took yeah, months, yeah. we took months, because we enjoyed it so much. You know, we enjoyed that, that period. Yeah, we went up to Montreal for three or four months and were in a on hotel off, room yeah. and he was cutting something. So in the afternoon, he'd come over and we would just talk about what the world was. Do they have newspapers? Do they have mm. phone? Because we were creating a world and um, it was really great in that period of time where you can say anything. The one thing you don't want to do is get a producer in the room because then you say, well, what if we had an army truck well, and they, they run, get up and truck, run out you know. of the room yeah, and they're they calling do. about, where, yeah. where can we get this? Yeah. And yeah. it was a bad idea to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember that about the liquor store, that's right. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember, oh, well, I, well, what do I need to lie inside? Mm. But it, it was interesting, this location, because the, um, abandoned apartment building is on the right hand side so it's right near i'm not sure the film really establishes that there were a couple of shots but i'm not sure if they're in the final movie that establishes the liquor store in the parking lot hugh goes to the liquor store because he's he's he doesn't want to be seen going to the apartment mm -hmm. block i'm not sure if he quite get that 
But um, yeah, the exterior of the apartment building was just over to the right there, and um, then the interior was a sack because the, the, the location didn't work. But. So were you storyboarding the stuff, drawing it out yeah, physically? Yeah, we storyboarded it. Um, are you walking through with a viewfinder both. on the day, and you have a plan, but you can change the plan? How is that all working? A bit of everything. You know, on... on yes, on, you know, words, yeah. okay. Well, with some, right. some oh, directors good. with... <laughs> With Joel and Ethan, it's everything is storyboarded quite, you know, and not just the frame, but I mean, it's the size of the shot, not yeah. the frames exactly, but um, it's all storyboarded and most of the time you stick to it, I must say. Um, but you can change it if something changes But some days it changes. Set, yeah. some, some days it will change completely and you play the whole thing on one shot and, mm. never, and then go home at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but with... Denny, yeah, we kind of storyboarded. He has a Sam Hudecki. Is, is, how do you pronounce his name? Hudecki. Hude, Hudecki. Uh, is his storyboard artist. And so, yeah, we storyboarded most of it. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of freedom on the day to play with it. One of our um, favorite shots in um, Prisoners is outside of the house where you just push into a tree. And that was just something on the day. That was not storyboarded. They never thought of it because mm -hmm. who would? But he said, oh, wait, 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 let's just push into a tree. And then, of course, we had the uh, producer behind going, wait, we're not going to make the day. Why are you taking are you this shot? What are pushing into a tree for? And yet it's one of the best shots. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. It's a little bit of a mystery. Yeah. Why? yeah. But, but it just seems to work. Well, he's, Denny's just got that, that wonderful sense, sense of imagination yeah. and what, what will go with the sort of music or the tone mm. of the thing in the moment that really works. I mean, yeah. Now, I know you guys said you're kind of picky about what you want to work on, and well, what can we talk about that? Like, what, what, what's that process when you decide as you're looking at stuff and thinking about it, and what pushes you into a yes or a no? Well, connection to the script is one thing, and connection to the director. Yeah, knowing that, trying to find out if you get on with the director or not. I mean, you know, most of the films we've done over the, over the last so many years have been with the directors we know. So um, in the past, you know, I've had good experiences with a director I haven't worked with and had absolutely terrible experiences with a director I haven't worked with. You know. Um, so, you know, you get kind of wary about these things. But yeah, you want to be connected to the story because you're putting a lot of effort and time into something and going through a lot of stress. And you kind of, yeah, you want, to feel you're doing something that's uh, of value to yourself, I think, really. And you mm. kind of want to f do something that you think that, yes, I would sit and watch this movie because there's something in it that moves me or the character changes enough or something like that. You don't want to mm. do a script where you think, why? Right. Well, what's going yeah, on? It's interesting, Prisoners, because you read the script mm. and it could have been kind of like a gothic kind of, you know, yeah. I've, I've seen it a million times sort of film, CD gothic mm. kind of horror film in a way, if it had gone that way. But it was interesting, Denny wanted to do it and the film that he'd done before, before this was on Sandy. So you couldn't see the man who directed on Sandy taking this script and doing the, the thing that he wouldn't have liked. Right. And so it was kind of like, yeah, sure, we talked to him, but it was a no-brainer because it was just so such an interesting thing to see what he would do with it. And mm. he wanted to be part of that, you know, and he's a lovely guy anyway, so. Okay. Because, I mean, it's, yeah, scripts can go either way. Like, yeah. it's hard to read. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Well, we've been on them Move. when they've right. gone the other way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, why didn't I see that? But, yeah. <laughs> I never yeah. would have thought this would have happened. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to hear more about colored light and working with colored light because colored light can look really garish. It can also look monochromatic if it's not done right. And it's also super saturated uh, in this really great way and what that post process was like. Well, on this particular scene, well, I, I, I say we shot, we shot the pink joy. I mean, the pink joy looks like the pink joy we shot for the playback. Can we pause it here for a second? And, uh, and you know, that pink was, was something, yeah, and we just Ooh. created in the playback. And, and so that's why the pink is the pink in this shot. And the blue and the, uh, the atmosphere and the, 
I mean, obviously, some of the background is CG, or where the spinner is in the background sure, is, moving, a, yeah. is a CG uh, comp. You know, I mean, it's put in there. We didn't have a spinner that far back. We didn't have a, a, a set that was that big. I mean, this was pretty big, but um, but there's always there was always a reference in the background of how the light would bloom in the atmosphere because the atmosphere was in there. It was actually fog. I mean, we created fog with mist us a minute now, so water water drops. And, um, and we basically try and shoot it the way we want it at the end. We're not saying, oh, we'll add more to it at the end or we'll yeah, that, change this in post. We're that, trying to get yeah. it like a film, you know, get that it the saturation way saturation is the saturation. That, that was, was, that was on the, the set. Dailies. That's not... Yeah. That's, we didn't, there's nothing in Blade Runner that's done in post in terms of the color and, the, and there might be a tweak of a contrast. And sometimes, you know, you get an imbalance because I didn't get my exposure right. Uh, so you, you're kind of, you, you're smoothing things yeah. out. But the color's the color. I mean, you see this pink or you see the, 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 the golden light in the Wallace building with the mm, reflections yeah. on the water, the water reflections. That's all in camera. That's not, you know, that's not something that's done later. I mean, are you doing custom lots for each film? No. no, we have a lot that's basically filmic. We, I think before Sicario, we knew it would be hot sun and we might have tweaked with the contrast a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you're always, anyway, afterwards, tweaking the contrast a little bit because it depends on your viewing, where you're viewing it on set, and you might have, you might be bright outside anyway, so you're not really seeing what you're getting. But... Yeah, we just have one lot. I think having to keep track of lots would be yeah, a horrible do extra thing to and do. And so that gives you a solid ground because you it's know like now how it's all It's just like gonna... shooting film. I mean, yeah. Yeah. maybe you might be shooting with two film stocks, but I wouldn't be shooting with more two, than two film stocks on if I'd been shooting Blade Runner on film. Mm. So it's not any different than that. I mean, but it's simpler because it's one lot. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to go to questions, but I'm just going to summarize what I've learned which is turn off all your lights except for one <laughs> and only use one light. <laughs> and, well, good. And that's I said to somebody to yesterday, success. you know, I to remember James Wong Howe read something he wrote quite towards the end of his career, oh. life. And he said, you know, when he, he'd done a scene early in his career, it would have taken 60 lights to light yeah. it. But, um, but the, the point in his life at the end of his last films he did, he, he was down to 10 lights from 60 and he wanted to get to one but he didn't he didn't feel he'd have enough years to do it so, you know, well. so that's the goal so you all got the chance to get there straight away and just put one light on and leave it at that <laughs> okay great okay let's go to some questions okay um ciao team deacons Hi. you look Hi. marvelous tonight <laughs> <laughs> good lighting well, right yeah uh, good lighting um, so here it is do you think that you will go down as one of, if not the most radically legendary DPs of all time? <laughs> yeah, that's the way Roger okay. thinks. Yeah. yeah, I really think like that. That's, that's my life's goal. Yeah, no, come on, give me a break. That's just not part of the thought process. I, I'd like to feel that some of the films I've been part of Thank with you, some Sharon. lovely directors like Denny or the Coens, I'd love to feel that those films will exist in the future. And that's all I hope for, really. Well, thank you. I'm very grateful that I was born in the same timeline as you, <laughs> so I could see your wonderful movies. Thank you. Good thank night. you for saying that. That's very kind. Hi, my name is uh, Alexander Abraghi, and uh, I'm very much interested in visual storytelling and the effect that has on the viewer. So my question kind of relates to that. Um, your camera work in Blade Runner feels very natural. It shows the world in a way that grounds it and immerses us in that world. I think a lot of sci-fi films today have the tendency to do these, you know, especially with CGI, these swooping 360 degree uh, perspectives of, the, of a world, especially sci-fi. And I think yet, like you choosing to uh, shoot it and frame things in a way that ground it, I think it just allows us to connect to the audience more. So my question, or the audience to connect to the content. So my question is, I was wondering what is the discussion like between you and the director in terms of 
making these worlds immersive for an audience and choosing how you're going to frame these worlds so that we get invested into them and we feel connected and we don't feel so detached from this, you know, this spectacle. Well, I think that's so much that's Denny, you know, I mean, you watch Dune, I didn't work on Dune. I mean, it's a similar, similar kind of way of telling stories. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, again, the conversation we had talking about the film was very much that. We want to create a real world. And so, you know, things like Denny's Los Angeles was, was kind of based on maybe something that could happen. It could snow, it could rain too much. If you've been in LA last week, you <laughs> thought we were in Blade Runner. And, you know, a seawall, well, that ain't so much mythical anymore, is it? And, you know, the idea of the Red Vegas came from like the Haboob dust storms from North Africa. You know, you know, things in the film were based on, you know, things that actually are out there. If you, if you, you, you watch the news or look at the National Geographic or whatever, you but know, I, they're real things. I also think that the, taking the time in the beginning to say what is this world yeah. gets reflected in the final product because sometimes if you approach a, a sci-fi film and you, oh, let's do this and this because this is cool, let's do this, but you didn't stop and say, well, in this world, would they do this and that? You know, that yeah. keep trying to... I think it's really interesting that people yeah. relate to... <laughs> People relate to like uh, Rango or How to Train Your Dragon because there's an animated film that feels like more like the real world. And what you're saying about a lot of sci-fi sci -fi films now, which I don't think are sci-fi, they're just pure fantasies. They're not so real sci-fi as Philip Dick or somebody. Um, I, I, I think it, it's strange. Those films seem to be taking what animating, animation used to do, which is the camera swooping around and doing anything that it can, because it can, but it's got nothing to do with human vision in a way, and it takes you out of reality. Uh, I, f I find that really interesting. But then that's me. <laughs> I also want to say too that um, you had mentioned yesterday, and this is a really important point for you guys, is that as you were walking around the groups, you were noticing people are looking at their little monitor on the camera and the other monitor up, and you had talked about how the importance of the viewfinder and putting your eye to a viewfinder and being immersed in that world that you're shooting. And it feels mm. bigger when you look, you had said. Yeah, I mean, it's a funny thing in a little viewfinder. It's actually, you might think you're just looking at a little screen, but it's not because it's actually showing you a much bigger vision. I mean, it's interesting, the difference between an ARRI viewfinder and a pan Panavision viewfinder, you know, film Panavision. It was always slightly further away. It was one of the reasons I shot with Ari because the viewfinder always brought the image right to your eye. Um, and so I, th I find it odd myself. I mean, it just times change, but I find it odd to see people yesterday operating off a little monitor on the top of the camera. I find that really strange. But then that's just, you know, things change. Hi. Um, first off, I just wanted to say you have one of my favorite scenes in cinema possibly, which is James Bond entering the Macau Casino. And I wish that was shown because every time I see that clip, it just makes my jaw drop. Um, and my question is, as a director, I find it very important to establish a common language between me and my collaborators. And um, I, take, I like to take jobs in other apartments so I can develop that language. And I'm just wondering, as a cinematographer, um, what do you think uh, directors can do um, to bridge that gap between um, DPs and director language and how, how um, collaborators can establish a language um, between themselves. It's kind of on the individuals because when we work with the new director, it's a new language, you know? Yeah, I, I, it's interesting because we work with kind of, I'm not mentioning names, but I've worked with a high name director that didn't seem to know much about lenses in terms of the focal length. Um, didn't seem to have an understanding of how it would adjust the depth of field between a foreground object and a background, anyway. And so, but I don't think that's necessary. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's just something that's inherent in the way people see the world that they can see in pictures in a visual language. You know, I think I think it's really important for a director 
to share his or her vision because that's what the director's there for. So if you are open about, and that's what we're looking for, we're look, what is it that you want to see? What is it that you want to see? And the more that in prep when you start sharing mm. these things and mm. then if you listen to what they're saying and it goes back and forth, you do develop a language that way um, because you, oftentimes with us it's kind of humorous, you know, oh yeah, let's do the, the pigeon or whatever we talked about in prep, mm -hmm. you know, and, but it means something because you've gone back and forth. Yeah, I mean, it's like everybody's got a different way of expressing mm -hmm. it. So, I mean, it, it's a lot not, of I don't think, prep. like I keep saying, there's not one way or wrong way, but a director comes in with a passion and a, a, a willingness or an openness to, 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 to collaborate with somebody and then you find and sometimes you won't find a, a common ground or a relationship because that's just nature of human beings. But, uh, you know, I think when a director finds a cinematographer, and certainly for me, when I've found a director that I can, I relate to, uh, and if it's mutual, it's obviously it's great, you know, but it's not always going to work. Hi, <laughs> thank you all for spending time with us here at DePaul. Um, you mentioned bringing experiencing, experiencing life into your shots. Was there a shot in a film you worked on that you used a personal experience that stands out to you? No, I can, I can mention one shot, but I, I just think it's your relationship with the, you know, it's the relationship with the story and the characters and it's the empathy, I suppose, for what's going on, you know? I, I, as a shot, no, I don't, I don't really say, oh, when I was in Africa doing such and such, I remember seeing such and such and I brought that to that shot, no. It's not that, but I mean, it can come from everywhere, anywhere. Um, sometimes a lot of the, the pacing of the way light goes or something. I mean, you can say some of, some of the, the kind of feeling of the water in Blade Runner might have come from the time I spent out in my boat fishing. <laughs> I'm watching the water. I know it's silly, but yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's all of those things. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you bring all those things to the table, you know. Thank you. Hi, my name's Rebecca. I'm a Hi. producer in First AD um, with goals to be a union First AD um, in my film career. And so my question is centered around that. Um, as a former script supervisor and as a director of photography, what is your relationship to the first assistant director when you're approaching a project in prep and then also with excuse me, and also when you're in production on the day? Well, pretty close. We don't like ADs that scream. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Neither do I. Neither yeah. do I. <laughs> but you know, I mean, just, it, just the scheduling alone, the mm -hmm. DP really needs to work closely with the AD because the DP knows how long something's going to take to shoot because he's talked with it or she has talked with um, the director and so knows what's involved in it. And so um, a good AD confers and uh, they also the AD knows, oh, well, we could change this location, so let's do half a day here and that. So that's really important. Yeah, no, it's really, I mean, crucial in prep that you go, go through the whole schedule with the AD. I mean, the AD is coming from one space and you're coming from another because maybe you've gone through storyboards or talked, suddenly you would mm. talk the scenes through with a director and stuff. So, you know, you might be able to say you can save a day somewhere in the schedule for shooting reasons and, and they might save it, want to save it for another reason, you know, so it's, it's, you have this trade-off. But also it's really important on things like, um, on No Country for Old Men, for instance, there's a long sequence that happens like from night into dawn. Mm -hmm. And it was a case of shooting one shot in the evening and one shot in the afternoon mm -hmm. to build that scene. So, cause you couldn't obviously do it all in, in one day or one evening or one morning. So it was like, how do you schedule a night shoot so you can shoot in the morning or how can you shoot uh, a, a end of day, day scene so you can shoot a dust shot and mm -hmm. just, you know, fit it all together. So it was all those, those kind of things as well as if you have two complicated lighting setups, then how do you get from one to the other? You know, how I feel, how do I get a pre-light 
So it's all those things. But then on the set, on the day, it's mm -hmm. very much about, okay, you know, let's concentrate on... The hardest thing on a film set, I find, is usually getting the actors and the director off the set so you can get ready for the next shot. Because <laughs> yeah, especially if things are going well, they're all having a good time. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, but you're going to be giving me a bollocking in a minute because I won't be ready to shoot in 20 minutes. You know? So it is all that. You know, of course, you, need, you really need to have a relationship with mm. the AD. Yeah. Don't you? And just a yeah, yeah. super quick follow-up. How do you maintain like, creativity when you're in those conversations with an AD, because it can be very logistical, but I appreciate like the creative perspective of an AD. So how do you maintain that in conversation when you're in the middle of a stressful set day? Yeah, but if you don't, if you don't have all the logistics worked out, then you haven't got the time to be creative anyway. So, you know, you, you, it, it, it's, it's all part of it. I mean, it's like, I think the job is part creative and a little bit creative and a huge amount is technical mm -hmm. now, is whether it's about the schedule or getting from A to B or what mm -hmm. crane you need or mm -hmm. or whatever I, you know uh, I, it's yeah so much of it is is a technical aspect but you have to get that done mm -hmm. it's like I always do lighting plans for, for for the sets that we shoot on because without that without having got all that done I mm -hmm. can't have the flexibility to think about other things on the day you know mm -hmm. but I think it's also um, always keeping in mind what are we trying to achieve yes mm -hmm. it's your job to logistically make it happen but if you aren't also able to say well the director really wants this mm -hmm. done this way um, but you're saying, yeah, but it would be so much easier if we could put this, this, and that. But it's what the director really yeah, wants, yeah, yeah. and that's what your job is, that's what our job is, is to, to get them what they want. And that's, the, that's putting the creative right in there with the logistical. Yeah, especially a director wants to shoot in sequence or something, oh, which is, yeah. I mean, it's, oh God, but, it, <laughs> but it, yeah. it, it, you can understand yeah. why on certain yeah. projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's, there's such a balance going on, you know. Yeah, but so sometimes, too, that you say, well, which ones can we shoot out of sequence? Mm -hmm. Which one are you okay with that? So you know what's important. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we could go on forever about yeah. this. but <laughs> Anyways, Let's. thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm a third year director here at DePaul, um, or directing concentration, whatever. Uh, it's an honor to be able to speak to you. You're someone I've admired for quite some time and seen a lot of interviews with. In fact, Dana put some of your interviews on our homework recently. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, my question, um, from seeing a lot of your films, uh, like they're all very, er, not your films, but the films that yeah. you worked on as a cinematographer, um, they're all very different in some way, but I can like still, you know, uh, hear those like parts of you or like how you express yourself as a cinematographer, whether it be like the lights or the way the lenses are placed. Or um, I remember even one time I saw an interview with you. Uh, they're doing a documentary of you, and you suggested using a wider lens uh, to capture the space around you and how that was like uh, important for in capturing the person or something. Anyways, I'm I'm going on and on, but. Um, I don't know. I was I was going to ask, uh, what do you think is important for like a creative or like someone in your position or even me as a director for like being able to find your creative voice? Because I think like as a young person, it's like hard to know what that is yet. But like, what has it been like for you? And like, how do you find that for yourself in your films that you work on or even in your experiences um, just going about your day? Well, oh. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Just... Uh... Just try and experience all the things you can experience. Really, just yeah, it's a, that's a hard one. I mean, I I the, when I was starting out, I was just doing er anything and everything I could do, and if I wasn't working, I'd be wandering out with a stills camera and, and that, or sketching, or um, how you find yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's being observant, right? And looking at things yeah, and saying, oh, I like this, and why do I like this? Oh, okay. Yeah, and no, I think you're right. that yeah. away. Yeah. I mean, it's just like I went for a walk this morning for about four hours, and it's just looking, you know? It's just experiencing a place and, and being a bit of a voyeur, I suppose. You know, just getting, getting the feel of somewhere and looking at 
the way light falls on something, or the way the people are acting in a certain place, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, Just being aware, I think, of you, humanity and the world around you, I think it's really important. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sure. It's a hard, it's a hard one, I mean, I don't know. Really. Um, hi, I'm Nevin. Uh, thank you so much for coming out uh, for this whole weekend. Uh, we're really excited. I'm sure everyone can agree that it's been exciting to have you. Um, uh, my friend Kyler actually brought up a good point uh, or good question about the kind of relationship that you have with the director and how you kind of establish that communication. And I kind of want to build off of that and kind of with the direct with the directors that you've already established a kind of relationship with. What are things that stand out to you that you tend to like or something that may attract you to work with a director compared to say someone else? Collaboration. Uh, yeah, if they're willing to collaborate. It should be. A, I mean, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. But passion. You know. I mean, if somebody, you, you really. Yeah, there's directors that don't seem that passionate about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to be doing it because they have something to say, and I find that really disappointing because you know, and have an opportunity to tell a story and kind of make a comment on, you know, who we are, what we are. I mean, I think. It's, kind of wonderful. Um, so it's passion, but it, yeah, as James says, it's collaboration. It's just, it's just uh, feeling that you're working with a whole team of people towards something and not, not, not like, a, I mean, I know some directors are auteurs and they, that's fine. You know, they can do anything. They can shoot it and cut it and everything that, and that's fine. Carry on. But that's, doesn't obviously as a cinematographer that I don't find that interesting and I don't personally find their work that's so interesting because I think the best work does come out of a collaboration between different people kind of like sometimes really butting heads when they're talking about idea you know ways of doing things and talking over ideas and I think that process is really exciting and interesting and can lead to something that's that's yeah, probably better than the one person is thinking in their own little head. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much. Hey, my name is Enzo, and I wanted to ask you about how you approach um, the opening and closing shot of a film, and if you see it any differently, or you just kind of go into it like any other shot. Oh, no, that is kind of interesting. Could it to about prisoners or something? That was really interesting with Denny. I mean, you know, in the script, <laughs> in the script, you go back down in the hole with Hugh Jackman and and, and, and Jake comes in and, no, it's all pally and lovely. Uh, but in the final film, it's just him kind of, did he hear that whistle or not? And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it's not me, it's Denny, it's the combination, mm. it's the talking about it and getting to that point. Um, I'm trying to think of another one. Now. Well, so some directors think about that, the first shot and the end shot, but yeah. other directors think about the first scene or the last scene and they aren't really thinking, okay, we're going to land on that shot yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important, though, isn't it? I was, yeah. I, you know, I think the first shot is really important because it, that's, that's the audience's entry into it and how do you get into it. And... Well, that was our last question because we're out of time. Oh, thank okay. God for that. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I just want to say thank you to Team Deacons, and this was amazing. Um, thank you.